coast to coast like butter toast. Look out, cook out, top shelf where mother never dusts. And obviously, let's talk about it. Today's guest on the Are We Chill podcast, one who's near and dear to our heart because we feel like we've grown up with this gentleman the last, oh gosh, 20 years. John Allers, the voice of the Anaheim Ducks, Ducks joins the Are We Chill podcast. John, welcome to the podcast. Guys, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. We, we certainly appreciate it. And, and uh, we, we were just talking before we jumped on. It's, it's, kind of fun, it's kind of funny and surreal. We feel like we've grown up with you, John. You know, us, me now being 34, Corey 31, Dusty, gosh, 27. You know, your voice has been in our living room for the last how many, you know, 20 plus years. And it's so cool to talk to you today. So thanks again. How are you doing? And we know you're traveling on the East Coast right now. How's the travel going and with the Ducks on this road trip? Well, it's, it's kind of winter back here, guys. We're in Buffalo getting ready for the game tonight against the Sabres, and uh, the wind was blowing hard last night. I'm sure some folks watched the Monday night football game, and they were well aware of that. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a, it's a stark reality in the world we live in. We are so fortunate in Southern California, but uh, you got to have an overcoat in my line of work, despite the fact that I live in Orange County. Yeah, we, we truly appreciate it when us Orange County natives travel to the East Coast, how we, we could wear shorts and sandals right now this time of year. So um, relative. exactly. So I guess getting right into it, and we'll get into your, you know, your history, your past a little bit with how you got started in the business. But how nice is it to have fans in the building, in the building to be around maybe some normalcy? But how was it last year for you with with COVID and everything that was going on last year as as a play-by-play -play artist that you are? <laughs> well, for, it was hard. Um, you know, it, it's funny because we have, uh, we have, you know, guys who run our audio on our shows. And I think, especially when I travel, I find out that, um, you know, we use the local guys in the trucks and everybody has to get used to the mix that, that they put in our headset. What, basically what I hear when I'm calling the game isn't necessarily what you hear at home. But I'm always a guy that I want a lot of crowd noise in my headset and many in my profession don't. Uh, they find that, you know, maybe off putting or, or a bit of a distraction. But I always used to use the term to uh, to my audio guys. I said, you know, I feel like I'm because they, they won't give you as much crowd noise as I want. Some guys don't give you any. And I used to say, I feel like I'm calling the game from my hotel room watching it on TV. Well, the reality was last year I was calling the game from a hotel room watching it on TV half the time. And even when I was at Honda Center calling the Ducks home games, there was no one there. Um, so they had to pipe in the fake crowd noise just, you know, to make me feel comfortable. Uh, I know they were doing it across the board on the shows as well. And, you know, the players have talked a lot this year about how much they miss the fans. I miss the fans, too, because it's hard for me to get into the emotion of the game and, and knowing a big moment is a big moment. If the crowd's not helping me with that, because uh, you know, you hear the crowd react to, to plays. I hear them react to plays. Um, you know, my voice fluctuates based on how important I think the moment is, or maybe how good the chance might be regardless of which team it's for. And without that, it made my job harder. Uh, certainly. And, and for us being fans all these years, it is so nice to just be back. And, and what a team, which we'll get into uh, in a second here, how special this year's team is, in my opinion, with this young slash veteran um, and, and coaches too. If you look at the coaching staff as well, it's such a, I think it's going to be a very special year, but kind of backing it up a little bit, John, you know, being a Michigan native, uh, tell us about how you got your start in, in the business and and what inspired you to, to do what you do today? My father worked in radio. So I was around radio from a very young age, used to go up to the office with him on the weekends. And, and he had been on air before I was born and moved into the sales side. But I got to see radio, which in the early 70s, which is when my first memories, late 60s, really resonate from. You know, it's the, the old theater of the mind. But then I got to see it and I got to go up there and and see the studio and meet the guys that were on the air for the radio station that my father worked for in a small town in Michigan. Um, and, you know, from that moment, I was a sports fan and I used to have a radio, whether it be a transistor hidden under the pillow at night that I'd listen to Detroit Tiger baseball games or whatever, whatever I could find on the AM dial late at night, it would put me to sleep. 
Uh, and my mother would of course come up and turn it off later and I'd wake up in the morning and there it would be sitting on the on the nightstand or what have you and realize that I hadn't pulled the wool over their eyes at all. But that that was, you know, that was my introduction to sports and the way that sports was delivered back in the day was very rarely was it on television from a local perspective and, and more readily and on a consistent basis, it was consumable on the radio. I uh, went to school at Michigan State and studied broadcasting and got fortunate to have an opportunity to, to work uh, within the Lansing market, which is home to Michigan State University. And I worked for a station that carried a lot of sports and that's where my interest was. So I got, I got very fortunate and early on in life, by the time I was, I think 26, I, I got a chance to call Michigan State hockey games. And I, I had known for a long time that play-by-play -play was something I would like to do uh, did a season of it and got good enough reviews from people that I thought maybe I could pursue this and and maybe I could skirt that whole real job thing for the rest of my life. And so far, so good. Don't tell anybody. John, happy to have you finally on. This is Corey here. How you doing? Corey, it's great to be with you. It is. It is. So I, I want to get right into it. So I mean, we've, we've gotten plenty of emails from our audience and our fans. Hey, when are you going to get your next broadcaster on your first one? I said, no better guy than John Alders. Okay. So I, I want to know with preparation on game days, I mean, with the COVID and, and, and now in present time, you're in the press box now. And I mean, being from home previously, what was it like? And what was the difference in, in preparing for a game day uh, with yourself? Well, during the pandemic, we were in the booth at Honda Center for all the games. Um, we weren't allowed necessarily access to the team. Um, at the morning skates at Honda Center, we were there as well for a little while, but then it became clear that, um, you know, we weren't going to be able to go in the locker rooms like we normally had, and, and it was easier to just stay at home and prep. Uh, we were given uh, Zoom access to, to um, Dallas Aikens last season. And I got to tell you guys, I mean, it's, it's different everywhere, but Dallas Aikens and this current coaching staff and the management for the Ducks have been great to us and really helped us, especially last season, do our job in what was a, a difficult situation. And, and Dallas has, has been very forthright with us and shared a lot of things that help us do our job. And were it not for that, you know, I, I don't know that we would have really had a lot to offer uh, last season that we we normally take pride in bringing to the to the telecasts, and that is information that you can't get anywhere else. Because last season we were we were as limited as as the fans were. The fans weren't allowed to go to the games. We weren't allowed to go to the practices. We weren't allowed to go to the skates. We weren't allowed in the locker room. We're still not in the locker room today. So it 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 changed. You know, our ability to I. I Thing, quite frankly feel good about what we were bringing to the table and we had to we had to try some different things it was you know I've told some people this year and especially some of the guys in our PR staff I've said you know when I do go to a practice they'll ask us who who do you want to talk to they'll bring them out of the locker room and on many occasions I'm just looking to talk to players I haven't met yet because we had players who played for us last season Sonny Milano would be one of them Vinny Letary comes to mind players that, you know, played quote unquote, an entire NHL season with the team. And I talked about them and tried to act like I knew what was going on with them. But the fact of the matter is I hadn't even had a chance to talk to them yet. So when I'm, when I'm approaching players now this season, very rarely am I asking questions about the four check and the power play and the penalty kill. I'm trying to get to know some of these guys. And then on the other side of the coin is I'm, I'm trying to just talk to the ones I do know and find out what their experience was like last season because it was different for everybody. And Ryan Getzloff, I think, made it very clear that it wasn't fun for, for them. Uh, we were happy to be calling games, but it wasn't as much fun for us either. Yeah, super unique times. Um, and, and it is nice that we're kind of getting out of that, that whole uh, dark hole in a, a lot of ways. Bringing it back a little bit, John, my question to you, you know, Tampa Bay, you know, that time you were there, how was that for you? You know, how, what was that like? Um, I know it was a little bit short. It's funny doing my research on you. You have a little bit in Tampa Bay and then there's this huge chunk with Anaheim, which we'll be talking about. But I, I got to ask how that was uh, in seeing their success now. It's it's pretty interesting. But how was your time in, in Florida? Well, it, it, it's a great memory for me. And I mean, when you chase a dream as long as I did, and that was 
You know, I want to get to the NHL. I want to do this at the highest level. And that was clear to me from the first season. You talked about my time at Michigan State. I called one year of games at Michigan State. Uh, the rights deal changed hands. Uh, the radio station I no longer worked for. Um, I had to make some life decisions and I decided to pursue it. And I got lucky and I went out to Colorado Springs and called games for two years at Colorado College. But I knew at that moment um, that I wanted to do it at the highest level. So I chased it for 11 years before I made it to the NHL. And, you know, when you mentioned Tampa Bay, they gave me my chance. And I'll always have a very warm spot in my heart. Uh, when I left there, I told people and I still do to this day, I said, I'll cheer for you guys 80 times a year. And there will be two games a year where I can't bring myself to do it. But um, not too many people left there anymore the, <laughs> that were there when I left 20 years ago. But it's still a, it has a very near and dear place in my heart. I had three great years, met some super people, made some relationships that I still have this day personally and professionally. Um, Tampa was not in a very good place as a hockey team at the time. They were trying to rebuild it up. And we didn't so much as make the playoffs any of the three years I was there didn't really come close to be honest I think the last year I was there, they missed by 11 points and we all know how far away that truly is in today's NHL, but it was the best of the three seasons we had there. Um, I got to work with john Tortorella, who I think is a very misunderstood man when it comes to who he really is as opposed to who he portrays himself at times to be. Um, you know I. I I met some great people. I got an opportunity to cover and get to know some great players and Dave Anderchuk and Marty St. Louis and, and uh, Vinny LeCavalier and Brad Richards, all guys that I, I consider friends to, you know, at some level to this day. And, um, and it, it brings a smile to me to see the success that they're having, that they have had. And anytime I get to go back to Tampa, it's a, it's a fun trip back for me. Now, John, it must you... have been, uh, oh, sorry, Corey. It must have been pretty neat um, to see them lift the cup in 04 uh, as well. Because you know? <laughs> that's the group that you were really connected to, you know? Yep. Yeah. So. And it's easy to smile about it now, Bobby. But at the time, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. There are mixed emotions. And I've heard players and coaches talk about it. You leave a team and they win the cup two years after you leave. And there's a, there's a little part of you that your heartstrings are pulling at you as much as you feel good for those people. And mm -hmm. I do. Um, it, it was, a uh, it was, you know, it was, it was sweet. tough in, in some ways and made so much easier three years later when the ducks captured the cup, because in that moment I was able to realize that, you know, just be happy for those people and, and don't look back and don't look over your shoulder and say, gosh, that could have been me too. Because as I mentioned, the team was so far away when I left in 02 and just two years later, they're raising the cup. I mean, it hadn't even, as I mentioned, hadn't even sniffed the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And then in short, relative short hockey term time, two years later, they're lifting the cup. And, and uh, it was, it was a bittersweet time. I'm, I, I can't lie. It was, it's hard. It's a, you want to, you want to take the high road. You want to be the better guy and say, Hey, I'm really happy for them. And I was, but there was a part of me that was, you know, I was kicking myself a little bit too. Right. It's, you know, life is what it is. And, and every circumstance and decision you make brings different consequences or different results. And, and, and it's so much easier to look back than when you're in that moment, because you, you, sometimes you just, you can't help. Emotions are a funny thing. You, you can't control them. We're, we're all human, John. And, and I think just coming off that run we were on in 03 or 0203 as well. Right. So you come off that. Yeah. Yeah, Crazy having, time, right? And yeah, having lost game seven that year, um, you know, I remember talking to a friend that summer and it had probably been close to two months since that series with New Jersey had ended. And they had, they brought something up, you know, they're sports fans, they're, they're, they know what I do. And they said something to the effect of after a while in the conversation, well, you, you sound, you still sound pretty bummed out about that. And my initial response was, who lost the Super Bowl this year? And whoever I was talking to is a pretty good sports fan and they couldn't come up with it. And I said, exactly. I said, you never, never know if you're ever gonna get there again. And from a purely selfish personal standpoint, I was like, man, that was so close. And I don't know, I don't know if we're gonna get back there. Fortunately, they did and they, they captured the ultimate prize. And I, I was fortunate enough to be on the outskirts of it and got to experience it in, in my own 
in my own way. And, and, and it makes all those things go away. But if, if we were sitting here right now and 07 hadn't happened for the ducks, those things would still be really hard for me to swallow. Right. And, and then that transition with you coming to Anaheim in 2002, 2003, I mean, you got, that's where it all started. You know, the success just, cut, you know, started coming for you, right? Yeah, it started and, with me. The, that's the all you. When it's I got you. There, right? It's you. You're the good luck chart, right? <laughs> yeah. But, but, but with that transition, a, a certain other player came in at the same time in a way, and that was J.S. Jagir, a close family friend of ours. And, and to, to get to know Jiggy and to call the game on Jiggy being a net, what was that experience like all those years with J.S.? I mean, I really want to know and want you to touch on that. Well, Jiggy's uh, got to be an all-time favorite, um, not because he was so good and he was and could have won two Conn Smythe trophies, which would have really put him in a, in a very elite select group, um, but such a good guy, as you guys know, um, just a real person. Uh, Jiggy was always honest. I remember him telling us at times, you know, we were like, uh, you know, geez, what, are you, what else do you do? You're, you got to be good. And, and he just looked us right in the eye and said, I'm not a very good athlete. I don't do anything else well. I'm a good goalie. That's it. I mean, Jiggy's just his pure honesty and, you know, and he's so real all the time is what made him so much fun. The thing that a lot of people didn't know and maybe you've read or are still not aware of is what a, what a, what a supreme leader he was on that team. And, and you don't hear that much about goaltenders and it doesn't mean that they can't be, but um, I remember when they were down 0-2 after losing the first two games in New Jersey in the, in the final. And I don't know if they scored a goal in the first two games in Jersey, but um, they came back and the world was, you know, everybody said, okay, Cinderella's, you know, can't find her slipper and they're, they're going to get swept. And this is how this is going to go. And, and, uh, and Jiggy stood up in the room and, and he was having none of that narrative. And, and he, you know, called his teammates out and said, we're not done. This isn't over. And sure enough, they won the next two at home and took the series all the way to seven. But, you know, one of the hardest days for me was when the Ducks traded J.S. Shiger. Um, we happened to be not on the road with the team. I don't believe we were televising the game. I know it was in Florida against the Panthers and word came down that he'd been traded to Toronto. And you guys, unless you've been around a team or been part of the day-to-day -day workings with a team, you don't realize how immediate that is. A player gets traded and he's gone. I mean, it was at a, an off day practice. He got word, he left the rink. He doesn't go back on the bus to the hotel with the team and he's gone. And that's that. It's so definitive when it happens and it's the, it's one of the hard things about the game that, you know, players really have to deal with, but everybody else is left behind. And in a moment you find out a player's gone and they're gone and you don't even get a chance to say goodbye. As, as silly as that might seem and as meaningless as that might be in the moment for a lot of people, for those of us that feel a connection to a player or a person, whatever it may be, whether it's a coach or a player, um, you know, that it's, it's just, it's like, it's like that and they're, and they're gone. And, you know, so we fly in to meet the team wherever the next game was, and Jiggy's not there. And uh, until, you know, I think I saw him at a reunion for the cup team, the 10-year reunion, I didn't see him again. And, and um, you know, he became such an integral part of the organization, uh, whether he was the face of the Ducks or not. I mean, that, that, that run in 03 is, still resonates so magically 20 years later. Um, there is no way that team was in the playoffs that year without his play in the regular season. Everybody points to the, the run in the playoffs, and rightfully so, as one of the great goaltending performances in Stanley Cup playoff history. But I remember we got to Christmas that year with that team, and they were on the outside of the playoffs, you know, looking in. And, and even when they did make it, they were seventh in the West and didn't get in by a whole lot. And we used to, that team couldn't, you talk about a team that couldn't score goals, that team couldn't score goals. And we used to joke amongst ourselves during the television timeouts with the guys in the truck and Brian and myself in the booth, we'd look at each other, the Ducks would score a goal. And we just look at each other and we'd say, come on, Jiggy, come on, Jiggy. Cause we were pretty sure there wasn't gonna be another goal scored. The only way they were gonna win or get points is if he gave up zero or maybe one goal. And and, and he did it night in, night out. And, and then to do it again in 07, I remember 
his, uh, his son was born right before we started the opening round against Minnesota. He had some health issues. Randy Carlisle felt it was best to let Ilya Brzgalov have the net until Jiggy's uh, personal situation was a little more stable. And I can tell you guys to this day, you may know this, he is still sour about that. Jiggy is salty that he was the number one goal. He had been all year. And then we get to the playoffs and Randy gives the net to Ilya Brzgalov. He didn't feel that was the right decision and he never will. And that speaks to the competitor that he was. And, and that's just scratching the surface of what a great person he is. Yeah, certainly one of the most humble guys we've met. Um, and he truly is a family friend of ours. And to your point, you, you really do build such bonds with these people. They're all humans at the end of the day. And, right. and when, when they leave, it's like a huge hole in your heart. Like, I can't believe I'm not going to see this person on a daily basis. And just the character of that man, as all the brothers know on the call, uh, on the podcast, excuse me, it's, you just don't make a jiggy. There's only one, you know, yeah. or rep, replicate a jiggy, should I say. Um, and, and I'm sure that run in 03 was so special because that's really the beginning for you, you know, yeah. and uh, a hell of a run. To this day, you, you said 20 years later, it's, it's pretty special. Selfishly, I feel like this man should be, uh, his banner needs to be raised uh, in, the, in the Honda Center. I know you could speak upon that too. And, um, and obviously a Hall of Fame candidate as, as well. But um, you think his banner will be up there sometime soon, John? I do. Um, I have it on no authority, but um, I do think it will be there. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that no one has worn 35 since he left. Um, I think you can do the mental math on that a little bit and know that, um, you know, I think that that's a, that's a number that will hang next to um, Tamu and, and Paul and, and Scotty up there. You know, it's hard, it's hard to forget. Tamu has such a standing in this organization, but one of the most special moments ever was the last regular season game for Tamu, which happened to be against Colorado. And Jiggy played in that game for the Avalanche. And um, the way that Tamu dragged him out on the ice with him and they did their laps uh, hand in hand. You can't make that stuff up, guys. That was that was something. Definitely agree with you. And and one thing that stood out to me, what you said was two things about Jiggy real and the guy's passionate. I mean, he worked overtime in practice. He did all he can to, you know, he worked his ass off and he didn't look at the results he got. And, and the whole point of you saying, you know, it is tough. In, the, in this business, you get attached to these players and then they're gone in a blink of an eye. That's the toughest, one of the toughest parts, I think, in, in your job. Um, but I have a, a big question and the boys and I were talking about this. Which game in your career stands out to you the most? And it was the most fun game you called on. Wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, a couple come to mind for me. Uh, before I get to that, I, I will point out, you, you bring up a, a great memory with Jiggy. And that was, and I've never seen it since, he used to probably launch at least four or five helicopters into the crowd or into the stands with his stick in practice each year. Because I'm here to tell you, he was out to stop every shot every day. He wasn't letting anything go in and practice. And when he would get frustrated in practice, it was not uncommon to watch him break his stick over the crossbar. And if it wouldn't break, he'd just throw it in one piece into the crowd. And if it did break, then he'd throw it twice into the stands. I shouldn't say the crowd because there was no one there. Um, but it was, uh, we, we used to chuckle about it, but it was, it was that competitive nature that you mentioned. Um, you know, he comes to mind for me, too, when naming maybe the most memorable, memorable games. <clears throat> Excuse me. I remember one of the games against Dallas, and I don't remember which one it was, where he made the, the scrambling save that you can still see on ESPN today, going left to right. The stars kept getting rebounds and taking shots, and, and there was a wide open net. And I think he lunged back and laid the paddle of the stick down and made the save. And... And I think my call, I remember my call was simply, come on. I just couldn't believe it didn't go in the net. And, and it, was, it was in that second round series against Dallas. The, the individual games that come to mind, the game one against the Red Wings in 2003, first playoff game I ever called at the NHL level, went triple overtime. If you've ever or were ever in the press box at Joe Louis Arena, 
uh, you know that they didn't build a press box at Joe Louis Arena. And they kind of forgot. And then they just took out the top two rows. And the press box was about six feet wide. And the first two feet of it were taken up by a high bar countertop that was probably the height of a bar. So you had to actually stand to call the game anyway, which is what I do. But we were way down and it was it was it was a dead end press box. You came up. <coughs> I beg your pardon. And off the stairs, there was a there was one bathroom and then it ran the length of the of the arena and then it dead ended at the other end. And because the game was ESPN was carrying it. I think TSN was carrying it in Canada, the Red Wing local broadcast. And then when you're the road team, you're the the fourth in line. And for some reason, I think there might have been a French speaking broadcast as well. <coughs> so I think there were five shows. So we were all the way down at the end. And it was quite the chore to slide by sideways, stepping behind all these people sitting at this high counter. Excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me, lady with a baby, to get all the way down to the bathroom. So we didn't have what we call studio support to this day, where we would throw it to Kent French between periods. We had to cover <coughs> all the breaks in the intermission. So you can imagine by the time we get to the third overtime, if you could even get down to that bathroom, there was probably 120 people in the press box, one toilet. Oh my. So you can imagine by the time we get to triple overtime, I'm in a little bit of trouble. Okay, so I think you guys can figure out what I'm talking about. Yeah, I got issues. <laughs> we all and, do, Johnny. Uh, we all do, trust me. Yeah. Us Gats boys. And, and, and there's Jiggy down there. He's like 60 saves into it. And finally, Korea scores uh, pretty early in the third overtime, thankfully. Oh, um, nice. But I, I mean, it was it was a whale of a game. And, and you know, never mind my personal situation. The, the, the most vivid memory I have is when Luke Robitaille hit the crossbar in overtime mm -hmm. about 10 minutes into the first overtime. Right. And the red light goes on and the building goes crazy. And the puck comes out and they keep playing and everybody at Joe Lewis thinks the puck went in and you look down at the ice and they're, they're going to review it. And there's Jiggy going like this, Wait, waving it off, Got all his off. equipment yeah. on and right. he, there's no doubt in his mind that it did not go in the net. And that was a real galvanizing moment, I think for, for the team and the organization, because Jiggy was, I mean, he didn't, he, he couldn't have known. He didn't know because he was facing the shot. He gets beat by the shot. It hits the crossbar and comes out. He, he couldn't have known, but he was, he was standing there just telling the world for everyone to see, nope, it didn't go in. I know it didn't go in. And sure enough, it didn't go in. So they played for, you know, to the detriment of my bladder, they played for about another 90 minutes of hockey and got into triple overtime before Paul Correa won it. But, you know, so many things for me, my first ever and it, uh, Stanley Cup, playoff game it goes to triple overtime the ducks win they're not supposed to win korea scores the goal jiggy has a galvanizing moment the team goes on to sweep the red wings and all the way to game seven of the stanley cup final if i had to single out one game that's the one Absolutely. quite the iconic moment with him waving the hands and you got the little post little mark on yep. the post and it's just it's so cool and, and kind of bleeding into that now the 06 07 journey um you have leaders like a jiggy like a Scotty, like a Pronger. I mean, the list goes on. Marchant, um, my Salani, my my goodness. I mean, what was that like being around? In my opinion, from toughness to skill to coaching, again, in my opinion, one of the best teams ever created. You could argue that O2 Detroit team, but in my opinion, biasly, that Ducks team is one of the best teams ever created by Mr. Burke. What was that like that season? How special was it that season, John? Being around that you team. Know it was, it was very special right from the get-go. I think they went 12 and 0 and 4 out of the gate. Uh, didn't lose a game in regulation. I remember until Calgary sometime in November. So you're 16 games in. Um, I'm sure you can look it up when the date was, but it, they don't lose a, a game in regulation until um, November. Then they go to Edmonton, um, you know, and it's a circus there from a media standpoint because Pronger had left. We get to the hotel on the team bus and they've got a press conference all set up at the, at the team hotel for, for Chris Pronger, just to address the media in Edmonton for his first time back. And 
And I, and I remember, uh, you know, I, Ilya Brzezgalov had one of his broken English moments with the media um, that morning at the morning skate afterwards, because all the questions were about prongs and, you know, Briz is from Russia and he, and we were there, it was right before American Thanksgiving. So it's late November and it is no word of a lie, guys. It is 20 below zero already in November in Edmonton. And it's so far north that it's dark at four o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, completely pitch dark at four o'clock in the afternoon. And after getting in that night and experiencing all that, somebody in the media asks Briz, you know, what do you think about, you know, Chris Pronger and he wanted to leave and all this. And Briz just says, he says, what, what, what do you mean? He, he, he's not a bad guy. He goes, it's, it's 20 below zero. It's dark at four o'clock. I, I'm from, I grew up from Siberia. He says, who wants to play here? He's not a bad guy. Just, just you know, <laughs> who wouldn't want to leave? Come on. Just being honest <laughs> in the moment. And, and, you know, and of oh, course God. the Edmonton media is so off put by that they were, but that kind of spoke to who the, who they were. They were who they were. Um, Pronger put money on the board that night. And I think he, I think he said he would take the team to a, a, a football game in Tampa on him later on in the, in, if they would win. And that was when the Ducks never won in Edmonton. We never, we had no luck at the, at the, uh, the old Northlands Coliseum there. They couldn't win to save their life. And I remember they, they won the game in overtime. They pulled it out. And it was, it was you to thought they just won the Stanley Cup, the way those guys reacted both on the ice and in the room and on the bus going back. I mean, it was, it was one of those moments where, you know, Pronger was definitely a leader on the team, but, you know, they all, they all circled around him. They circled the wagons around him and supported him in that moment in what was a, a tough time there. And then of course they all reaped the benefits. They got to go see the Buccaneers play somebody on a, a day off and, you know, just have an event, a team event together. And, and they just, they rolled on from there, you know, whether it was, Jiggy and, and and his wife dealing with a difficult situation with the birth of their firstborn and and Briz stepping up and winning the first three games against Minnesota and finally he loses game four so Jiggy gets the net back but you know just the way that 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 team went about their business it felt special all season long um, if you ask me Chris Pronger put that team over the top it was a great team that got to the Western final the year before Scotty's influence was immediate. Um, one of my favorite moments was in 06 when the Ducks beat Calgary in the first round in game seven um, at Calgary, a three nothing win. And our team, as the clock is winding down, they're standing on the bench and banging the boards and they know they're going to win. And um, Scotty's just sitting at the end of the bench and he's, he's completely emotionless. No, not even a smile on his face. Everybody's partying jumping around him and patting each other on the back and Scotty's just sitting there he's like this is this is what you do you win in the playoffs I mean he'd been through so much in New Jersey that you know but it was so new to the organization and the group and then when prongs came on board uh the next season it it really felt like immediately from that moment it was Stanley Cup or bust and and, and then the magic in Detroit with Tamu in game five and everybody forgets about Scotty scored with Jiggy pulled and less than a minute to go on a fairly fluky goal to force that overtime. I mean, those were moments that made you feel like it was meant to be. And fortunately it was. Right. And, and needs was just calm, cool and collected. I mean, he won so much and he just, Hey guys, it's just another day for me. You know, he comes yep. over, gets his brother cup. That's a great story. But in, in transitioning to the present team today, um, before the season started, the media counted you guys out. They're not going to do anything. I mean, still, there's some chirping going on in the media, but they've been a little quiet now. I mean, you guys are winning. You're showing. You got this young talent and some veteran leadership in Getsty, who, by the way, is playing like he's in his mid-20s. I mean, the guy's incredible. But I want to bring up two players, and that's Trevor Zegers and Jamie Drysdale. I mean, Drysdale's like, the way he carries the puck up the ice, the speed, I mean, the way he handles the game, he's so comfortable and confident. He's playing like a veteran and same, same with Trevor, the guy's got swagger and he's, he's a big talker right here in the locker room and just getting the boys going. And it's just been so fun to watch both guys. And I can't imagine what they're going to be like in their mid twenties and all that. So what's it been like to, to be around those guys, but to also just witness and call the game on, on them both and, and the young guys. Well, it's energizing. Uh, I think our players have said the same thing. 
uh, especially players like Getze and and maybe the older guys, Shattenkirk, Henrik, guys that have been around a while. And you don't you don't lose your perspective, but sometimes you forget it. Um, and when these kids come in, you mentioned Z. You think he talks a lot in the locker room? He talks a lot on the bench. He talks a lot on the ice. He talks a lot on the bus. He talks a lot on the plane. I think he talks in his sleep, but you know, it's contagious. Huh. And, uh, you know, Jamie, to your point, I think is overlooked because of Trevor and, you know, Trevor's let's, you know, let's call it like we see it. Chicks love the long ball. He puts up numbers. So that's sexy. Uh, Jamie Drysdale is overlooked in my mind because of, of maybe because he's on the same team as Trevor Zegers, but this kid, it's not fair to even say this on your show, but he reminds me more of Scott Niedermeyer than anybody I've seen since Scott Niedermeyer played the game. Now, Scotty wasn't as fast as Jamie is now. I didn't get to see him play much when he was 19 or 20, but I'm telling you what, this kid Drysdale's the real deal. And I, I'm, I'm overcome by what he's able to do at 19. He's playing 20 plus minutes a game. Uh, he backs down from no one, despite the fact that he doesn't have the physical stature really to win the tail of the tape with many of the guys he goes up against. When the game's on the line, he wants to be out there. I, all of them do, but when you're 19, maybe, you know, a lot of guys would be willing to say, ah, okay, you know, let those guys handle it. But man, he's got some poise. Um, and he, he, to me is, is very impressive. Um, Trevor's got puck skills like no one I've seen in a long, long time. I don't know if you guys saw the game last night, but he made a play in the third period. It had absolutely nothing to do with scoring or anything. He's high in the zone in the defensive end and the puck comes around the boards to him. He's on the right wing. He's a left-hand shot and he reaches back on his forehand and he takes the puck flat on the, on his stick, which is facing the ice surface and he picks it up and he throws it over his head I thought he was going to hit the scoreboard with the puck and Alexander Ovechkin's standing about 15 feet away from him in the neutral zone about to forecheck him. And he just looks up and watches the puck go over his head and it bounces on left wing into the offensive zone. And the, the ducks almost get an offensive chance out of it in a three, three tie. And I mean, to watch him in practice at a morning skate or just to watch him in warm up is, is really a, it's, it's a, it's a class in puck skills. He's, the things that he can do with the puck, sometimes for my money, to a fault. He had a breakaway a couple of games ago. He went between his legs. I mean, didn't probably need to do that on a breakaway, but he did. He didn't score, but you hear coaches say it all the time, and Dallas Akins is among them. He said, you know, when a player has that sort of creativity and skill, you can't try to, you know, squash it. You've got to let it happen. He's going to learn that sometimes the, the right play is, is the boring play to dump it in, go to the bench for a change, uh, sometimes chip it up the boards. But, man, the things he can do with the puck are exceptional. And, oh, by the way, he scores a lot, too, um, which catches everybody's eye. Uh, Isaac Lundestrom, I think, has been seriously overlooked. He's not a rookie, but he's just turned 22 years old. And because of the young talent that's on this team, you're seeing some players get seriously overlooked for what they're doing with this team right now. And it's exciting. It's, you know, the wins and losses are great, but when you've got that energy around the team that these young players bring too, that's contagious as well. And, and it makes everything just so much more exciting. We said it early in the year when they, they were two, four, and three, you know, it was far more entertaining. The results weren't there, but it was far more entertaining. Now that the results are there, you know, are you entertained? Cause I'm thinking the answer is probably yes. Absolutely. Silky smooth uh, on and off the ice. I would, I would imagine John dusty, anything for John. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. The, the producer always gets a question in there, but uh, I guess my question is you've been able, I guess we all have been able to grow up with these great broadcasters, not just here in Southern California with, you know, Bob Miller, um, Chick Hearn um, and all these, uh, all these other great ones. Who did you look up to? I know your dad was in, in the industry, but who was someone that you looked up to that you kind of wanted to resemble uh, when getting into this? You know, I, I grew up uh, listening to Ernie Harwell, who was the longtime play-by-play -play voice on radio for the Detroit Tigers. I had the opportunity to meet Ernie um, late in his career and was 
um, so happy to find out that he was as gracious and nice as I thought he would be. Um, you know, the, the hard thing about, you know, sometimes achieving your dreams and meeting some of your heroes is, is sometimes you meet your heroes and they don't turn out to be what you envision them to be. And that's not their fault, but it's disappointing to you. And, you know, I have a, I have a vivid memory of when I first came out to call Ducks games my first year. So it's 20 years ago. I'm 13, 14 years into my career. I've made it in the NHL. I'm on my second team. And you, you like to think to yourself sometimes, you know, oh, I've, you know, I've made it or I've, you know, I've seen um, the people who would influence me the most. And while Vince Scully didn't influence me as a broadcaster, I remember watching a, a Dodger game, my first fall out there with the Ducks. And I kind of was casually watching, maybe I was fixing dinner, it was on in the background. And then I sat down and I really started to watch. And it took me about three innings to realize Vinny was working alone. And it was a time in, in the broadcast industry where we were seeing more three-man booths than we were two-man booths. And yet here's this guy calling LA Dodger baseball, which is one of the preeminent franchises in all of sports. And he's doing it on TV and he's calling it by himself. And yet it took me three innings and I'm a broadcaster and I pay attention, I think a little more than some people do to even realize that he was working alone because he was carrying the show that, that well and that seamlessly. And oh, by the way, what was Vinny? Probably 80 at the time, maybe 78, something like that. And I just remember it, it was kind of, you know, it was such a remarkable, uh, I guess, realization from me. And I realized just how good he was. I know those of you who grew up in Southern California, you talk about uh, you know, the, the cadre of, of, of great long-term broadcasters that you had, especially here in LA. Bob Miller stands out to me, not because I was a fan of his work, but because I was a fan of the man. Um, I reached out to him when I was in Colorado Springs, Bob Johnson, Badger Bob was running USA Hockey. And I approached him and went to lunch with him one time, told him what my dream was. I wanted to get to the NHL. And he said to me, well, you know, we had this guy at Wisconsin, his name's Bob Miller. He went to the NHL. And so I reached out to Bob, and um, then when I met him, when I got to the NHL, um, you know, he was just so gracious to me and shared with me a lot of things that, um, you know, that only he and I know. And and uh, he was just so good to me that the the, the lessons I learned from all those people were, um, you know, always always be open to helping other people and. And I know that I get, I get approached occasionally, maybe you know, 10, 12 times a year, especially in the off season by young broadcasters who are either working in the business or trying to get into the business and ask me if I'll listen to their stuff and, and can I help them or make a phone call or will I critique their stuff for them? And I never, I never hesitate to do that because I do not forget what people did for me along the way. And those are the guys I look up to. Ernie Harwell was a guy I listened to. I had a chance to meet him and interview him. Didn't really, he wasn't a mentor to me. Um, but those other people were, were people along the way that, that influenced me, whether they realized it or not, because of the way they treated me. And, you know, when you're new in this business or new in a league, um, sometimes you just, you know, you just need somebody to be kind to you to, to help you feel like you fit in, even if you don't yet. And uh, I'll never forget that and always try to pay that forward because that's, you know, that's important in life to everyone, not just in broadcasting. And, and the people that took the time, they're the ones who influenced me the most. That's a, that was a great question, Dust. I mean, that's a great answer as well. I want to go quickly back to the young talent real quick. I want to bring one more thing up. Um, over the summer, I got to spend time with Max Contois, Comer, Bo Gru, and Mason McTavish. And, you know, as you know, Bo's shown, he can play. He's, he's a shutdown guy. He's been a great penalty killer. And I think he'll get more time with the team going forward. But Mason McTavish, third overall pick in 2021. The guy, I mean, the scoring ability and his size, he's, he's a big boy. I mean, and, and I think it is nine games he started with the team. He really proved himself, hey, I can play and I can be here full time. I know the, the, the organic way of doing things with rookies is sending them back to juniors, get them seasoned, and then when they come back around, they'll get another shot. But what was your thoughts on, on Mason's play? And also, you know, what's the future look like with him being a part of the organization? I think we could use him right now, uh, to your point. 
uh, Corey, because, um, you know, unfortunately with Max out of the lineup, there's a need for, you know, a big body on the wing. Um, I think the overriding decision was made because they, they didn't want to waste time with Max um, or um, excuse me, with Mason playing the wing because they really have him earmarked to play center. Um, I thought in all honesty that they were going to let the 10 game threshold go by the ducks that is and, and burn a year of his contract and have him stay with the team until the world juniors kind of what they did with Max Comtois a couple of years ago, then send him to the world juniors and make a decision after that. The, you know, the business side of hockey is not very much fun for fans, but the threshold of where his contract kicks in for a year of service in the league, which makes him one year closer to free agency is 40 games. And I never thought he'd get to 40 games this year with Anaheim because they covet him and they want to keep his rights as long as they can. But I didn't think the 10 game threshold was going to be one they were going to stop short of. So I was a little surprised to your point. I've been very impressed with Mason and what he's been able to do again at age 18 and and, you know, I don't ever think you can go wrong when you wait on a younger player. I know it's hard for our fans after having missed the playoffs the last three years to see a player they think can contribute right now and say it's in the best interest of the player and the organization to not have him here. But the reality of it is that that is the time proven, um, I guess, approach with a player like Mason. But he he did not look out of place. Um, at all and maybe the impending return of Max Comtois also factored into the decision to to make that move with Mason when they did because I know Max has been skating he told me recently that basically as soon as he can hold a stick and he's comfortable holding a stick in a game situation he will be back so I think we'll see him sooner rather than later which is is a, a big help as well so uh, Bo Grew is back with the team right now. I think we'll see him in the lineup soon with this heavy schedule that they have on this road trip. He's, you know, I, I always hate to see a young player get pigeonholed into that defensive role, if you will. I remember we thought that with Ricard Raquel after he went his first, I think, 40 games without scoring a goal at the NHL level. And boy, was I wrong about that. Um, you know, certainly he has the skills to score goals. So you, you just... It's, it's just really early in a guy's career to tell him, you know, don't worry about scoring, just check. But that's the role that's available right now for Bo on a fourth line. Um, who knows, he could show us a, an offensive upside that we haven't seen in the very near future. Yeah, the, 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 the future is certainly bright, John, and it's exciting to see with, with all this talent. You know, we're talking about all the great things, which there's so much to talk about. But, you know, it's not all berries and cherries, in my opinion. I would say... Uh, John, we are lacking in one department, and that is, well, you saw last night, a Wilson, a Reeves. Um, that new 2021 skill plus toughness. My biggest fear, John, I'd love to hear your take on this, is we will make the playoffs, in my opinion, uh, very soon, if not this season, we'll squeeze in. I am fearful for a, a Z, um, a young guy like himself, skating around to absolutely get pummeled. We do, yeah, we have Nick, but you really do need someone, in my opinion, a little bit bigger. What do you think about that? Do you think that is a void right now for us or am I completely off? I don't know that I would call it a void. I think Nick is, uh, Nick's very capable. Um, I don't know whether everyone would consider him a heavyweight. Uh, the Tom Wilsons of the world are, are few and far between. <coughs> um, you, you look back on that 07 team and, you know, the toughness came from Brad May. It came from Chris Pronger. It came from George Peros. George was certainly a heavyweight. Um, but, you know, you get into the playoffs and you see a lot of times that those players are the players that get scratched come playoff time because the games uh, have so much, you know, significance to them. Um, I think the Ducks approach it from a team toughness standpoint again. You know, you got Josh Manson who's very capable. You've got Nick Delorier, who we know is capable. Um, I was really intrigued last night. I don't know what Buddy Robinson's role can be uh, with this team, but man, is he a large human. Um, that, that comes in handy. And don't forget, Ryan Getzloff has never backed down in his career either. It's not the role that they want for him, um, but that doesn't stop him from doing it, never has. I, I think every time he's fought his career, we've all held our breath, just like we did when Corey Perry fought. 
because you're one broken finger away from saying, man, you should never fight. But, um, you know, that's, that's the honest part of Ryan's game and Corey's game that I, I used to actually respect and still do respect so much more as you, as you pointed out, Ryan's playing like he's 26, not 36 again. So I think his, uh, there's no hesitancy in his game to stand up for these guys. The other part of that equation is, it's on those players, the Trevor Zegers and, and uh, Jamie Drysdale as well, to protect themselves and not put themselves in a position to where they can they can get hit and get hurt. Uh, Jamie took a shot last season in Minnesota, I remember, that we all thought was a little questionable. Uh, Z plays with a reckless abandon that I think at times looks like he's a little unaware of, of his surroundings, but I, I don't think that's the case. I think he's very aware. And the thing you have to remember about a, tr- a player like Trevor is he's always had a target on his back. Every level he's gone to, he's burst onto the scene and it's hard to, you know, it, you can't ignore the, the puck skills. And it, especially a game like last night where every time he touches the puck, he's dangerous. He's around the puck all the time. And, and even the crowd in Washington was responding to him last night. You could hear the oohs and ahs with his spin moves. And, and when he undressed Jensen in the first period, just went right at him and went right, right through him basically and creating scoring chances. And um, so, yeah, everyone's aware of him, but he's also aware that everyone's aware of him. Uh, it isn't to say that, you know, that he can't get hit, he can't get hurt and that, that, that uh, he's not the biggest guy out there because he's not. But I, I continue to think with him and Jamie, we are just scratching the surface. And I really think with Zegras, offensively speaking, we're just scratching the surface because he's come so close to scoring so many times when he hasn't. And he's still got 21 points in like 23 games played. I mean, the sky is the limit here. And I don't know whether I gushed enough earlier, but I am, I'm over the moon about Jamie Drysdale, guys. I, I don't know if I made that clear or not. Absolutely. He, he's something special. John, one thing, uh, the last thing I want to touch on today on my end is we can't, we got to give a little love to Troy Terry here. I mean, the guy, Mm -hmm. his off season, I mean, I, I, his workouts and all that, I know he changed something up. I mean, he really worked his ass off in the off season training and all that, but there's something about his game that's so different now. And I mean, this point streak, I mean, with how hot he's been, having Getzi as his line mate does help a little bit, you know, but they've complimented each other really well. And like I said earlier on, Getzi's playing like he's in his 20, 20 year prime, you know, 25 years, whatever. So, I mean, what do you think? I mean, Troy's just like, something's different and and you've seen it all year. And what do you touch on that? Touch on Troy's game uh, all year so far. I asked him, I think it was last week, straightforward. Did you do anything different? And he said, no. Um, you know, a lot of players, one thing that has been consistent, uh, Alexander Ovechkin mentioned it, a number of veterans have mentioned it, but Troy mentioned it as well. Um, just getting back onto a normal routine for these players. I, I know the playoffs didn't end until July for the teams that went all the way, but most of the players in the league were able to get back onto a normal training regimen. And when I say that, I mean that from a calendar standpoint. You know, they, they work out in the summer, they skate, they don't start skating again until August, but they do all their dry land with their individual trainers, or maybe they skate all summer, whatever they do. Last year, they did that, but then they didn't start until January. And there's a rhythm to that. And it, and it comes with, you know, with years and years of, of routine and having done it and knowing what works for you. I asked Troy, what'd you do different? He said nothing. And, and, and it, he, he made an interesting point to me. He's 24 years old. And he said, you know, I did the same thing I always do. He said, I just think my body received it, was finally ready maturity wise to receive the workouts and, and took the extra weight that he gets from the weight work that he did. And, and you know, to your question, I think he's just stronger. Uh, we've heard it with Troy Terry ever since he came on the scene that he, he, he looked like he needed to put some weight on. He looked like he needed to get stronger. Going back to the the things I talk about that Trevor Zegers can do with the puck. Troy Terry has some pretty, pretty mad puck skills of his own too. And he always had those, you know, when he came out of Denver university, he had those Um, Ryan Getzloff's point the other day was, you know, I think Troy used to try to beat guys twice instead of just after beating them once getting the puck on net. He said, now this year he's beating them once and he's getting the puck to the net. But those, those puck skills were always something he relied upon and was confident in. 
because you would see him try to beat guys twice or try to beat three guys when he didn't maybe could use his teammates better. But the thing I notice is he's, he's not getting knocked off the puck. He holds the puck. He still has those puck skills, but now he doesn't lose the puck and he's able to put them to, to use for him a little bit better. I, I was reminded of a, of another story when, when Troy said, you know, that about his body being mature and ready to, to take, to take to the workouts better. It was a few years ago, Hampus Lindholm came to training camp and Hazy and I were marveling, you know, he looks bigger. Gosh, he looks, and I went over and I said something to him in the locker room. You know, he looked bigger. What'd you do? Did you do something different? Did you change your workout? No, no. And Hampus just finally looked at me and he said, I think I grew. And I, I didn't realize, you know, I'm an old man. I was like, oh yeah, he's 21. That still happens for you guys. Um, you know, I think we forget. It's like, yeah, he's 20, 21. He can still grow. Troy's 24, but his body is continuing to mature. So yeah. sometimes we just need to be reminded that, yeah, they're young and I'm old. <laughs> we forget too how mental this game is. And I'm sure in the offseason, Troy did a lot of changing in the mindset as well, I would imagine, as, as, as well. So Dusty, Take it away with another question. One last question. Yeah, I know, I know time's running out. Yeah, but thanks again. But I think we would be remiss not to bring up uh, your partner, Brian Hayward. Uh, I feel like there's always has to be a special connection with the play-by-play -play and color commentary and being together with him probably longer than any of us has a relationship with, <laughs> with someone or family, friends. You, you're with him more than anyone. So what's it like being uh, getting to grow with Brian Hayward and kind of being his partner through, through this whole journey? You guys oh, are married. Been yeah, it's, it's been my honor uh, and my pleasure. His wife calls me his road wife. I don't know how much I like that term, but uh, you know, when people give you a moniker, sometimes you don't get to, <laughs> you don't get to veto it. Uh, you know, it, it, we're good friends. And I, I think, and I hope that comes through on the air. I think it's important. Uh, not everybody has, you know, has that, um, you know, that ability, uh, some, some guys are put in situations where they, they don't get to have that, but we've, we've had it from a very, from the start, he he's been very giving with his time and information to me from day one. When I met him before we actually became broadcast partners, I remember coming out with Tampa and, you know, seeing Anaheim on a back to back when I didn't get to go to a skate or a practice. And, and he was, he was, you know, very generous with information that helped me on the air. And I remember, I remember that. I remember saying to somebody, you know, how important that can be to us to help us tell the story of the other team and, and sound a little more knowledgeable than maybe we would have been otherwise, the sharing of information, and then to get the opportunity to work with him. It's funny because, uh, you know, Hazy's a little more techy than I am. Uh, he's a little more on the cutting edge. Uh, I was just joking with him yesterday. Uh, after the morning skate in Washington, he, he pushed me to do something I probably wouldn't have done. Uh, we rented a couple of those Lime scooters in DC and we went out and saw the Jefferson Memorial because we both were talking about how we hadn't been there before. And you know, you're in your you're in your suit and your dress shoes, and I'm zipping around DC on this this Lime scooter, which I was a little apprehensive to do at my advanced age. And uh, you know, I was able to negotiate things through my phone to get the scooter unlocked, but you know, you never know when you're going to take a tumble and uh, maybe have to pay for it. But I, I even thanked him afterwards. I said, you know, you, you push me outside my comfort zone. And, and that's, you know, that's a good thing. He, he's, you know, I think he and I have, have helped each other as broadcasters. He was doing stuff for NBC and for Versus. I was doing stuff for Versus. There was a little bit of a change in the industry a few years ago where they wanted the game to be more conversational. While we weren't working together on the national shows, we were both taking turns for a little while there. And I think we both kind of consciously tried to change the way we called the game after we'd been together for a couple, three years at the time. And I think it, it made us both a little better together. And at the same time, the level of preparation we both bring to the booth is one that I think pushes each other as well, because uh, you don't ever want to be the guy that feels like he's less prepared than the other one. And uh, no one's more prepared than Hazy. And and he's as good as they get. And, and again, I think at the end of the day, it all boils down to friendship. And, and hopefully that comes through at least once in a while on the air.
Absolutely. And it, it certainly resonates to us, the audience, John, uh, how great of a relationship you both have. And in winding down, I always ask this to our guests, and, and this has been special for myself and the brothers, John. We have grown up with you. So whether you like it or not, you're, you are like Uncle John to the Armored like Show it. podcast. I don't like okay? it, okay. You're going to have to. And we respect the, the heck out of you, and we, we thank you again. But again, winding down, um, John, what do you want your lasting impression the legacy of the Allers name to be when you are no longer here. So not just professionally, but as a human that we've talked about on this podcast, what do you want people to remember you by, John? Well, I think it goes back to probably what I said earlier about, you know, when young broadcasters reach out to you, it's, it's flattering for one, uh, because, you know, somebody values your opinion. Um, I just, I guess I, I would want people to, to, you know, I, I would want to leave people with, with a good taste. And the feeling being, regardless of, of what you think of my work on the air, I would want people to, you know, to say that um, that I was helpful, and that I and that I was that I was either, you know, a nice guy to them or fun to work with. You know, the one thing that we we haven't touched upon is we've got a great crew behind us on the air, and one of the things the Ducks and Fox and now Bally's has been really sensitive to is that we've had a lot of the same people in place um, on our television crew, which is basically a core of about eight to 10 people. We travel with most of them and um, you know, they've, they've gone to great lengths to keep them together. And we have a, we have a great relationship with those guys and, and hopefully, you know, they appreciate working with me and, and have enjoyed working with me as well, because um, you know, none of us are, are bigger than the show. None of us are more important than any others. Uh, you guys probably have never heard of the guys that are most important to our show. And that's our producers and our directors and our EVS operators and our graphics coordinators, guys that help us tell the stories that we choose to tell and put it all together behind the scenes. And those are the guys that I would hope would respect me uh, because they, they knew my level of preparation, but also at the same time, my willingness to to be easy to work with and to be fun to work with. And, and again, going back to, I just, you know, I, I really hope I pay it forward. Absolutely. Well, uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of this trip. Stay thank warm you. out there. And again, John, thank you so much for joining the Are We Chill podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. It was my pleasure. Thanks, John. We'll talk Thank soon. you, John.